Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Roosevelt House. I'm Harold Holzer, director of the house. Um, this is a very special day for many reasons, but my grandson says it's a special day because it's a palindrome and ambigram. Does anybody know what that is? <laughs> Today is 12022021. Forwards, backwards. So that's the. <laughs> so it's, uh, I don't know, it's the first time in 200 years or something. I had to take note of that. So welcome to those of you who've uh, joined us in person and those of you who are watching on Zoom. It's wonderful to see our crowds steadily growing as we continue rolling out public programs. Of course, Eleanor Roosevelt always draws a crowd. Um, as her biographer, Blanche Wiesen Cook, tells us, and Blanche is here, she used to visit this one-time family home um, after her husband sold it to Hunter College. In those days, when the house served as the headquarters for student clubs and activities, Eleanor might drop in and talk to students. And if I'm not mistaken, Blanche still remembers encountering the First Lady here. And Blanche, by the way, is about to mark, and we will find some way to celebrate. I usually give my admonitions about cell phones first. So everyone, turn off your phones. Um, Blanche is about to mark, and as I say, we will mark, the 60th anniversary of her graduation from Hunter College. So that will be an event. <laughs> As I'm sure you know, Eleanor and her growing brood of children lived here from about 1908 until 1933, save for the years that FDR served as Assistant Secretary of the Navy in Washington. It was here that Eleanor nursed uh, Franklin back to health after his bout with polio. From here that she emerged into what they used to say about political wives emerged as an asset, but more than that, as an activist, slowly gaining confidence and influence as a progressive conscience, but most of all as a humanitarian, which we will be hear, hearing much more uh, tonight from our speaker. But here is where she was also first inspired, whether by maturing as a human being or simply through a desire to get away from her mother-in-law, we're not quite sure, or a combination, to get out of the house and do things uh, for society in general, ultimately becoming, as we know, a friend to the friendless, a voice for the voiceless, and a champion of the oppressed. I'm sure you, many of you who are here have also heard me tell the story about the house being built and then given to Franklin and Eleanor by FDR's mother um, as a Christmas present. And it was a gift that kept giving because it came with Sarah moving in to the west side of the house and Eleanor the east. Uh, Hunter President Jennifer Rabb likes to call this the first New Deal. <laughs> if these rooms could talk, we could, of course, eavesdrop on the conversations Eleanor had about her domestic skills with her formidable mother-in-law uh, also discussions about whether or not to end or continue her marriage, conversations about her inching toward a career in public service herself. Or maybe when we're upstairs in the Four Freedoms Room uh, to buy books after this event, um, we can imagine ourselves on the scene in that room the day Sarah decided that it shouldn't be two rooms separated by a wall divider, but one. To to represent the grandeur of their family, and thus gave herself unfettered access to Eleanor's side of the building, as she put it, for the next 25 years, sometimes at the least expected moments. I love that description. I have no idea what she meant, but we can imagine. And one floor above that is the small library that FDR used as his transition headquarters after his election in 1932, forging right here in this building the foundational building blocks of the New Deal. And then just down to the south of that is the parlor from which FDR gave his brief address the, the morning after the 1932 election uh, and then filmed it right after that for Fox Movie Tone News, surrounded by his mother and two of his children. Eleanor was in the building 
but she was downstairs on the first floor where you all signed in tonight, um, talking, chatting with the press. Maybe that was the first spin room, but leave it to Eleanor Roosevelt to have invented the idea of spinning the story. I think there was a slight problem with Hoover's concession at that moment. So with all that history in mind, all that history of place, it's kind of ironic that we're meeting in the auditorium this evening. Of course, it's the largest public room in the building, but we can't help remembering that in Eleanor's day, it serves as the kitchen for the house. So it's probably the space where Eleanor spent the least time um, down here. As Blanche has reminded us, however, she could make grilled cheese, and she often did that for students. Well, I focused on the personal side only this evening because our guest will be taking, talking to us about the public side, the humanitarian Eleanor Roosevelt, who argued before, during, and after World War II that refuge must be given to those displaced and to the survivors of those murdered during that dark period. So um, just a bit of housekeeping before I introduce our speaker. Uh, please silence your phones. Our guest will talk to us um, directly. As you may have noticed, I should have said in the beginning, Professor Leah Garrett is unable to be here this evening. But we get to hear from John directly, which is nice. Um, there will be a, a time for audience question and answer. A microphone will be passed. I know you all speak beautifully, but you need to use the microphone so the people on Zoom can hear you. Um, Mac Barrett, our programming curator will also be taking and relating questions that come from our Zoom audience. Our guest this evening, as you know, is John F. Sears, who from 1986 to 99 served as executive director of the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute, and then the next seven years as associate editor of the Eleanor Roosevelt Papers. And he's taught at Tufts, Boston University, and Vassar. His previous book, which I told him upstairs I enjoyed, was Sacred Places, American Tourist Attractions in the 19th Century. A really fascinated, fascinating look about not only these landmark buildings and spaces, but the origins of the American tourism industry. Um, this evening, of course, he's here to speak on his latest, Refuge Must Be Given, Eleanor Roosevelt, The Jewish People, and the Founding of Israel. It's a brilliantly researched and compellingly written book. Um, it may be a bit controversial, too. We'll find out, raising questions that we want, may want to explore in our Q&A. But that's why we're gathered here tonight. So it's a pleasure to welcome John Sears. Thank you, Harold. And uh, let me know if you can hear me well. Um, can you hear me? Take off my mask. That's a good idea. <laughs> wow, I'm free. Um, it's wonderful to be speaking uh, to a live audience, although I also know there, there are a lot of people on Zoom, which is good too. Um, thank you, Harold, for that introduction. And thank Mac for uh, helping to organize this event and organize me. Um, I want to say a word about Bill Vanden Heuvel, um, who was one of the founding board members of this, the Institute for Public Policy, and um, was my boss for 13 years. And, um, you know, F FDR was often considered the architect of the United Nations, and of course, Eleanor Roosevelt chaired the UN committee uh, that drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And Bill Van Den Heuvel was uh, devoted to both legacies, to both um, Franklin and Eleanor. And in fact, when I first uh, joined the Roosevelt Institute, it was the FDR Four Freedoms Foundation, and he, he, and it was an, uh, an Eleanor Roosevelt Institute. And and the those who were devoted to those two legacies were not always uh, admirers of each other or were in agreement. And he brought them together into one organization and made it a very effective organization. And it was it was a, a real privilege to to be there. Uh, when that organization was being developed by him and led by him. So um, I wish he was here to, to hear my talk. I don't think he would agree with everything. I'd be interested to what he, what he thought about it, but uh, he was uh, an amazing leader. And um, 
and left a lot of legacies behind, including a, a, in part this institute. So, um, beginning in 1909, um, Eleanor Roosevelt signed her letters to FDR ER. So I will sometimes refer to her as ER, which sort of puts her on the same playing field with FDR, where she belongs. There are several reasons why I think um, the subject about which I write in Refuge Must Be Given are worthy of attention. One is that the issue of admitting refugees to the United States that was so critical in the 1930s and 40s is with us again today. Many people are desperately seeking to enter our country and we are again erecting barriers to keep them out. Another is that Eleanor Roosevelt was a key player in the efforts of people who sought to bring more refugees into the United States in the 1930s and 40s. Um, but the details of, uh, of her work uh, have not been given sufficient attention. The, the books about refugee policy um, in the 1930s often give her a line or give her a paragraph, but they don't, they don't give us a full picture of what she did. In addition, um, Eleanor Roosevelt's biographers um, have not given adequate attention to her role in the debate about the future of Palestine and her devotion to Israel during the last decade of her life. That was very important to her, important phase of her life. Finally, the conflict between the Arabs and the Jews that preceded and followed Israel's founding still goes on. But I suspect many people only have a general knowledge of the circumstances that brought Israel into being. Eleanor Roosevelt provides an illuminating way to examine those circumstances, for she played an active role in the events that led up to Israel's founding. Her views evolved in response to those events. And as a member of the American delegation to the United States, uh, the United Nations, she participated in the debate within the Truman administration about the future of Palestine. One of the most compelling reasons for the existence of Israel, Eleanor Roosevelt wrote in 1956, is the fact that it is the only sure haven for the Jewish people. In troubled times when they are the first to suffer, it is essential for them to have their own country of refuge. She did not always believe that. Most of her friends, uh, her Jewish friends, were not Zionists. She was not a Zionist, and she did not support the creation of a Jewish state until 1947. Refuge Must Be Given tells the story of how she arrived at that point and how she became devoted to ensuring Israel's well-being once it was established. One of the reasons Eleanor Roosevelt finally came to the conclusion that the Jews needed a state of their own was her frustration with the limited success of her efforts before, during, and after World War II to secure the admission of more refugees to the United States. Although she supported those who sought to open America's doors wider beginning in 1933, um, right after Hitler came to power and her husband came to power, um, she did not become active uh, player until 1940 when Clarence Pickett asked her to help organize the United States Committee for the Care of European Children. Now Clarence Pickett was the executive director of the American Friends Service Committee, the Quaker S Social Service Agency. He and Eleanor Roosevelt became allies in 1933 after she visited the American Friends Service Committee's programs in the coal mining regions of West Virginia. They went on to work together on ways to assist the out of work coal miners, on fighting anti Semitism, and on efforts to admit and welcome more refugees to the United States. The United States C Committee for the Care of Children uh, initially sought to bring British children to the United States, most of whom were not Jewish, to protect them from the bombing of Great Britain in the summer of 1940. Later, it worked to rescue mostly Jewish children from 
uh, south of France from the unoccupied part of France. Eleanor Roosevelt also became a key player in the Emergency Rescue Committee, now called the International Rescue Committee, in the summer of 1940. The ERC was formed to rescue any Nazi political figures, writers, artists, and intellectuals trapped in unoccupied France. Eleanor Roosevelt's principal role with the Committee for the Care of European Children and the ERC was to help Pickett, Marshall Field, James McDonald, and other leaders of rescue efforts to gain access to the President and the State Department. She passed on information provided by the refugee organizations to the President and to Sum Sumner Wells in the State Department. Um, and she intervened on be behalf of individuals whose visas were being delayed or denied. And she vigorously protested the slowness of the visa process. Her efforts on behalf of refugees often brought her into conflict with Breckenridge Long, the Assistant Secretary of State, who oversaw the visa division of the State Department, and sometimes with her husband. Breckenridge Long's anti-Semitism, anti-immigrant bias, and excessive fear of subversives entering the country led him to thwart the efforts of the, the United States Committee for the Care of European Children and the Emergency Rescue Committee. Eleanor Roosevelt's principal contact in the State Department, however, was Sumner Wells. He was a good friend of both Eleanor Roosevelt and FDR. Uh, he had roomed with Eleanor Roosevelt's brother Hall at Groton, and he had, uh, he carried Eleanor Roosevelt's wedding train when, when FDR and Eleanor got married. Uh, she, he was one of the few people who addressed her as Eleanor when he, when he wrote to her. He was a puzzling figure, though. Everyone, everyone regarded Sumner Wells as sympathetic to refugees, to Jewish refugees, um, but he vigorously defended the visa process. He repeatedly claimed that there were no unnecessary delays. Eleanor Roosevelt knew that wasn't true. She had gotten reports from Varian Fry, the ERC's representative in Marseille, and from others, first-hand information that this was not the case. In researching my book, I gained insight into Eleanor Roosevelt's views through a stroke of luck. A friend of mine introduced me to Kathy Pfister, who was the daughter of Ava Lewinsky and Otto Fisker, two remarkable anti-Nazi activists. It turned out that Kathy and her brothers were working on a book of their own about their parents. Um, it was later published as Ava and Otto, also published by Purdue University Press. I met with the Fisters. We exchanged documents, um, mainly about three visits that Ava Lewinsky had with Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, Ava Lewinsky had gotten a visa uh, from in, in Marseille, come to the United States, and went to work for the Emergency Rescue Committee to get her fellow activists out of France, including her fiance, Otto Pfister. The most valuable document that the Pfister shared with me was a memorandum of conversation that Lewinsky wrote after she and her colleague, Paul Benjamin, met with Eleanor Roosevelt in the White House on December 27, 1940. One week earlier, the State Department had issued a, sta a statement in response to criticism of its policies that claimed that the department had approved most visa applications for political refugees. A New York Times editorial took the State Department's statement at face value. It is something of a triumph over red tape that one of, out of about 2,000 individuals for whom vigorous for whom various refugee committees have asked admissions to this country, half have already received visas, nearly all the others will receive them as soon as they can make use of them, and only about a dozen have been rejected. Eleanor Roosevelt did not buy it. Lewinsky reported that Eleanor Roosevelt did not think that the articles in the New York papers gave a real picture of the situation. In her opinion, Lewinsky wrote in her memorandum, things are going on too slowly, even after the examination of each case. Those who are obstructing more liberal refugee policy still hold their places in the State Department. 
She herself makes many interventions, but not always with success. It is clear from other documents that Eleanor Roosevelt was engaged in an ongoing argument with FDR about deliberate delays in the issuing of visas during the fall of 1940. She had now, no doubt urged FDR to fire the obstructionist in the State Department, who she said still hold their places. She had expressed her low opinion of Breckinridge Long to FDR more than once. Justine Polier, uh, one of Eleanor Roosevelt's allies in refugee matters, later remembered Eleanor Roosevelt saying to the president in regard to Long, Franklin, you know he's a fascist. And really cross, he said, I've told you, Eleanor, you must not say that. She said, well, maybe I shouldn't say it, but he is. Since Long and the other obstructionists had not been replaced, the only way to change the State Department's attitude, Eleanor Roosevelt advised Lewinsky and Benjamin, was to arouse public support for admitting more refugees and put pressure on Congress. You have to push public opinion over the, all over the country to make them understand that we do not object to the investigation of these people who seek entrance to the United States, but we have to do so quickly. These people for whom applications for visas are made are the most, for the most part, not communists or fifth columnists. They are known for their fight for the democratic ideals of this country. If Congress could be persuaded to support a more liberal refugee policy, Eleanor Roosevelt told them, that would influence the little officials in the State Department in Washington and in the consulates abroad who do not want to take any risk. She urged Lewinsky and Benjamin to approach the local newspapers, hold mass meetings, and demand the admission of more refugees, which they did. They went back to Buffalo where they were based and did that. Eleanor Roosevelt knew that something was very wrong with how the emergency visa process was being handled. She repeatedly pressed Sumner Wells to speed it up. She achieved some modest success, but it is impossible to conclude that Eleanor Roosevelt's bombardment of Wells for information on individual visa cases and her expression of impatience and at times outrage at the glacial pace of the process had more than a small impact on accelerating the issuance of visas. Only a fundamental change in policy procedure and the attitude of those implementing the regulations would have significantly increased the flow of refugees into the United States. Wells, however, continued to insist that the process was functioning well. That made it more difficult for Eleanor Roosevelt and her allies to persuade FDR that something was wrong with the way the State Department was managing the process and to do something to correct it. After FDR's death in April 1945, and after Eleanor Roosevelt publicly, uh, and after the war, Eleanor Roosevelt publicly pressured a still anti-immigrant, anti-Semitic Congress to pass legislation to admit more refugees to the United States. Again, she had limited success. She also accepted an assignment that would give her a prominent role in international affairs for the first time. In December 1945, Truman appointed her to the first American delegation to the United Nations. The rest of the delegation was composed of prominent men from both parties. Um, they saw the appointment of Eleanor Roosevelt as a political ploy by Truman to capitalize on her popularity and FDR's popularity. They appointed her to the United Nations Third Committee, which handles humanitarian affairs, where, as she put it, they thought she could do no harm. <laughs> it turned out, however, that the first issue before the United Nations at its first meeting in London in January 1946 was the fate of the refugees in the DP camps in Europe, including 200,000 Jews. Should they be forced to return to their countries of origin, as the Soviet Union insisted, or permitted to settle elsewhere if they wished to do so, as the Allies argued. Eleanor Roosevelt made her reputation as a stateswoman by debating Andrei Vyshinsky, the Soviet delegate, on this issue and winning. 
I won hands down, she said. <laughs> Ellen Roosevelt also became involved in the debate within the Truman administration about the problem of Palestine. While she strongly believed that the British should allow more immigration to Palestine, she was not initially in favor of a Jewish state. But in September 1947, when the United States Committee that had been formed to come up with a plan for the future of Palestine, proposed the partition of Palestine into a Jewish state and an Arab state, she changed her mind. Nearly all the members of the American delegation and the members of the State Department opposed the plan. But Eleanor Roosevelt became its most ardent supporter within the Truman administration. After the United States General Assembly voted in November 1947 to adopt the plan, she pushed for its implementation. She adopted that position for two reasons. First, she felt that the nations of the world, including her own, had not done enough to rescue Jews before and during the Holocaust, and they remained resistant to admitting refugees after the war. The establishment of a Jewish state, she believed, was the only way for many of the Jews who had survived the Holocaust to find new homes. Secondly, she thought the United Nations would not become an effective organization if its decisions were not respected and implemented. During the 1920s and 30s, after the United States failed to join the League of Nations, Eleanor Roosevelt had worked with Carrie Chapman Catt, Jane Addams, Lillian Wald, and other peace activists to advocate for international mechanisms for settling disputes among nations through mediation and the rule of law, and if all else failed, international police force. They'd been unsuccessful, and the League of Nations had been a failure. Now the United States, with the, now the United Nations, with the United States in the lead, offered a renewed opportunity to build an effective international organization to resolve conflicts. The adoption and implementation of the partition plan for Palestine was the first test of the authority of the United Nations. After the General Assembly voted in November 1917 to adopt, 1947 to adopt the plan, the Palestinian Jews accepted it, but the Arabs refused and began to attack the Jewish settlements. In January 1948, worried that the Truman administration would renege on its commitment to partition because of Arab resistance, Eleanor Roosevelt wrote to Secretary of State George Marshall, urging the creation of an international police force to implement it. Strong military force, she said, is the only thing which will hold the Arabs in check. Not enforcing the UN's decision would put the new organization in, da in danger of becoming as ineffective as the League of Nations. The Truman administration chose a weaker alternative. In February, Marshall recommended to the president that the best way to stop the violence in Palestine was to put the country under a temporary UN part, trusteeship after the British mandate came to, to an end in May of, of 1948, rather than seek immediate compliance with the partition plan. Eleanor Roosevelt was outraged. In a letter to Secretary of Marshall, she said, she could hardly see how the United Nations could recover and have the slightest influence since the United States was the only nation that could give it any force. And now we have been the one to take it away. She would have to state her feelings in public, she said. And if as a result, he wished her to resign from the American delegation, she would do so. She sent the same message to Truman. Both men knew that stating her feelings publicly meant making her criticism known through my day, her syndicated column, widely syndicated column. She could reach a very wide audience with her criticism of the administration. But it was not politically uh, advisable for them to uh, have her resign from the United Nations, so she, she stayed on. Um, she wrote two columns, criticized the administration, um, and said that by not fully backing the UN de decision with force if necessary, 
the United States had undermined the ability of the UN to act as a peacemaker. During the following weeks, the Truman administration continued to seek support at the UN for the creation of a trusteeship for Palestine. But the issue was settled unilaterally when uh, David Ben-Gurion declared Israel a state on May 14, 1948. The Jews had gotten the upper hand in the conflict with the Arabs and would go on to defeat the Arabs in what they would call the war, their war of independence and the Arabs would call al-Nakbar, the catastrophe. Eleanor Roosevelt sympathized with the suffering of the Palestinian Arabs who fled or were driven out by the Jews during the war and strongly supported the United Nations effort to aid them. But she did not believe that the situation in which they found themselves resulted from the infliction of injustice upon them by the Jews or by the United Nations. It was, she thought, the consequence of a conflict the Arabs themselves had started in defiance of the United Nations. They had lost. Now she believed they should move on. The refugees should be settled in other Arab countries. What is most striking about her views on the establishment of Israel is the absence of doubt. There's no indication that she wrestled with the moral complexity of the struggle between the Arabs and the Jews or grasped the Arabs' profound expression, experience of, de of dispossession. After Isra Israel's founding, Eleanor Roosevelt contributed to the success of the new nation's efforts to absorb thousands of immigrants especially children in its early years. Her devotion to Israel did not stem solely from the fact that it provided a solution to the, to the Jewish refugee problem. Refuge Must Be Given describes how she found in Israel a realization of some of her most deeply held beliefs about child welfare, public health, citizenship and a democracy, cooperative community building, rural revitalization, and the provision of resources to uprooted people who had lost everything so that they could rebuild their lives. Now I'm going to go back to the 1930s to pick up this part of the story. One of the greatest influences on Eleanor Roosevelt's views on the rehabilitation of displaced persons was Clarence Pickett and the American Friends Service Committee. When she visited the service committee's programs for out-of-work coal miners in West Virginia in 1933, she came away so impressed with their work that she joined Pickett in establishing a community for resettled miners in West Virginia called Arthurdale, where they could restart their lives. The Quaker program of long-term rehabilitation, she wrote later, seems to me to fit in with a philosophy which I have always held, namely that while charity may be necessary, our aim should be to get people back to a point where they can look after themselves. Eleanor Roosevelt also began in the 1930s to take an interest in the cooperative Jewish settlements in Palestine. Although, as I said earlier, most of her Jewish friends were not Zionists, they supported the Jewish settlements in Palestine because it was the one place where Jewish refugees were wanted and needed. Through her close friend, Eleanor Morgenthau, Eleanor Roosevelt learned about the work of Youth Aliyah, an organization that brought children to Palestine, these were often sometimes orphan children, but also children whose parents realized there was no future for them in Germany or Poland, or later on in Morocco, and um, they put their children in the hands of Youth, youth Aliyah so that they would have a future. Um, so, um, sorry. So Youth Aliyah um, brought the children to Palestine, taught them Hebrew, trained them in agriculture and various trades. Many of them went to work in kibbutzim throughout Palestine. In 1938, Eleanor Roosevelt wrote in her daily column, My Day, about two Youth Aliyah villages in Palestine brought to her attention by Hadassah, the Women's Zionist Organization of America. She found in these youth villages an expression of the same values she admired 
in the work of the American Friends Service Committee. Rather than offering charity, Youth Aliyah helped the children under its care to independence. In one village, Alna Roosevelt wrote, the children themselves carried on the entire management of the village with the guidance of instructors. Hadassah was founded by Henrietta Zold, who was strongly influenced by Jane Addams and Lillian Wall, the leaders of the settlement house movement in America. Zold established an institution much like the settlement houses in other cities to serve Baltimore's Russian Jewish immigrants. Inspired by her Russian students, she became a Zionist and visited Palestine. In 1912, after her return, she founded Hadassah. When Hadassah sent the first American nurses to Palestine, soon after its founding, Zold asked them to visit Lillian Wald's Henry Street settlement in New York before they left for Palestine to study its methods. Following the Henry Street model, the nurses settled in poor neighborhoods of Jerusalem and offered health services to its inhabitants. And that was the essential strategy of the settlement house. You, you went to live within the community you were serving and uh, got to know the people and their needs and so you could serve them effectively and directly. In 1920, Zold moved permanently to Palestine, and in the 1930s, after Hadassah became the American sponsor of Youth Aliyah, she became director of the organization's programs in, Israel, in Palestine. The work of Youth Aliyah and Hadassah naturally appealed to Eleanor Roosevelt, who not only cared deeply about the welfare of children, but whose earliest experience in assess, assisting poor immigrant populations had been in New York City's Rivington House Settlement House. Like Zold, Eleanor Roosevelt was strongly influenced by the founders of the Settlement House movement. In 1952, Moshe Cole, then head of Youth Aliyah, asked Eleanor Roosevelt to become the organization's world patron. She agreed and in that role visited Israel four times, touring Youth Aliyah youth villages and training centers, as well as the medical facilities run by Hadassah. She also became an important fundraiser for Hadassah and Youth Aliyah in the United States, Canada, Great Britain, even in Mexico. On her first trip to Israel in 1952, Eleanor Roosevelt visited Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan before she entered Israel. She met with Arab leaders she visited the Arab refugee camps, the Palestinian Arab refugee camps. She was exposed to the Arab point of view. Um, it didn't change her, her mind about um, the political situation, but she listened. She was always a good listener. Um, she'd been a, she was a strong supporter of the process of decolonization that had take place after World War II and took a great interest in the developing nations of the world. In fact, her 1952 trip to Israel was part of a larger journey that included Pakistan and India. Her account of that trip was called India and the Awakening East. But she had not completely shed a colonialist, even an imperialist consciousness. She saw the Middle East very much through Western eyes, through what Eric Said has called Orientalism, an Orientalist perspective. She regarded the 1948 war uh, as, as a war of independence, similar to the American Revolution. She identified very much with the experience of the Jews in Palestine as freedom fighters, you know, like, like our own uh, people who had revolted against the British. They were, of course, they were fighting the British as well as the Arabs in the beginning. Um, she saw the, settler, the Jewish settlers in Palestine and Israel as pioneers, like American pioneers. As pioneers, they had reclaimed the lands that the Arabs had let go to waste. That was her point of view. And she saw the Arabs as unmotivated unwilling or unable to embrace change. A 
arriving in Israel from Jordan, she found a completely different atmosphere from what she found in the Arab countries. The Israelis possessed the sort of American can-do attitude that she admired. There was a great excitement, a great sense of purpose, tremendous energy, a tremendous confidence that they could do anything in building a new nation. Israel also seemed to be practicing on a large scale the values that she shared with the Quaker leader, Clarence Pickett, and promoted in the United States in the 1930s. The concept of community responsibility and active citizenship was at the very heart of her own political philosophy. In Israel, she found this ideal fulfilled in the responsibility the nation took for the immigrants streaming into the country, and especially through its cooperative communities, its kibbutzim and youth villages. In 1959, Eleanor Roosevelt said that when she had seen the children who'd survived the Holocaust in the DP camps in Germany in 1946, after the first meeting of the United Nations in London, she went to Germany and visited the DP camps, including the one that, was, that housed Jews, which was called Zeilsheim. When she visited those camps in 1946, she thought it would be impossible to bring those children back to normal, happy people. And yet in Israel, I saw what had been done. She marveled at how youth Aliyah workers had managed to help the children put the horrors of the camps in Germany in the past by giving them love, but also by communicating to them their own excitement at building a new country. The reason for Youth Aliyah's success, she believed, lay in its ability to make the, the children feel that they were part of something momentous. You manage to give the children the feeling that they are needed, not that they are a burden, not that they are receiving charity, but they are needed. They are the people who are going to build Israel. Eleanor Roosevelt herself felt intensely proud of being part of what she regarded as a great historical event, the spiritual transformation of children broken by the horrors they had endured. There could be no greater happiness, she whispered to Moshe Cole during a fundraising event for Youth Aliyah in 1958, than seeing this miracle of resurrection realized and I myself taking part in it. Thank you. So I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. In support of the Marshall Plan, The Marshall Plan, yeah. Yeah, she did. It's not us. Okay. Is it on? There, yeah. there we go. Um, uh, yeah, she, she supported the Marshall Plan. What, why, why do you ask? Morgenthau, or at least Morgenthau, uh, didn't support it. Uh, am I right about that? Well, he, he wanted to turn, uh, Henry Morgenthau, you're speaking of, yes. Henry Morgenthau did not, he, he had a plan to turn Germany into a pr predominantly agricultural nation. He mm -hmm. thought that the only way to control Germany was for it to get rid of its industrial base, you know, not to become this dynamo of I industrial productivity, but to become basically an agricultural country. Um, but that plan was not. I know that, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. yeah. But I thought Eleanor not, was supporting. It did not fly. <laughs> supporting um, that, keeping Germany not, uh, not to industrialize, to continue to industrialize. It was already in place. Yeah. Um, and she was in support of Morgenthau about that. That's what I. Yeah, I don't, think, I don't think she particularly supported that plan. I think she understood that. that um, I mean, she became, it was partly because of the Cold War, which, which shaped her, her consciousness. I mean, she was, she was um, 
she was regarded by some people as a communist, you know, but but she she was really an anti-communist liberal, and and um, she knew that we needed to defend Europe against um, against Stalin. the Soviet Union, and she she knew the the, the the Russians firsthand because she had to negotiate within the United Nations um, Human Rights Commission. Mm -hmm. There were there were. S you know, Soviet delegate and delegates from other communist countries, and she find them, found them very difficult to, to deal with, and she got to know them personally uh, as, as much as you could. Uh, she was struck by how, you know, they, they always kind of went in pairs, and it, it was very hard to get to, to get personal with them, which she liked to do with, with anyone. And um, so she, uh, yeah, I think she supported, um, Blanche might have more to say about that, but um, I think she was supportive of the Marshall Plan and Germany's recovery. Yeah. John, you, you um, in the early parts of your book, and again in the conclusion, you talk about how Eleanor's um, casual anti-Semitism as a young woman, mm -hmm. which was typical of her class, you point out, and Franklin also you know, made remarks along the way that were, were noted by people. And and you you discuss her evolution. Yeah. Um, just say a word about that, because it is a remarkable thing that, that she evolved to the degree that she did. Yeah, and that's a complex issue, and I've been thinking about it a lot lately because of the, the um, because the issue of racism has become so important in our society, and, and anti-Semitism has reared its head again for sort of inexplicable reasons. Um, I guess it's always been there underground. Um, but she, yeah, she, y what's interesting about Eleanor Roosevelt is she continues to express what seems to be, you know, stereotypes of Jews into the 1930s at the same time that she's speaking out against anti-Semitism. And, um, I think that part of what we've learned recently is that it's very hard, even if you're an anti-racist, and even if you're an, maybe an active anti-racist, trying to do something about it, it's very hard to shed our, it's so deeply, racism is so deeply ingrained in our culture that it's very hard to, to completely shed your, your images, your the sort of reactions you have to certain situations or um, and despite your best efforts you know you're you're and so I think she it took her a long time to to let go of those tropes you know, and um, I'm not sure she really did until after the war um, completely until after the war um, Israel had a profound effect, I think, on the image of the Jew. You know, people have written about the, the new Jew who, who, who came out of Israel, the heroic Jew, the fi freedom fighter, um, and um, the pioneer. You know, and she, she admired uh, tremendously. Um, she became very good friends with Joseph Baratz, who, was, who had founded a kibbutz in one of the first kibbutz uh, to Ganya in 1909, and uh, he was sort of the ideal for her, this pioneering um, figure who was, she identified of course, with American pioneers and so on. So, um, but I think that how did she, how did she shed her anti-Semitism? She, she always learned, she, you know, she didn't go to college. She learned by doing and by interacting with people and many of the people she started interacting with in the 1920s when she became politically active, there were many Jewish leaders in the labor movement, in the, the Democratic Party, um, in, she was in the League of Women Voters, in, in all the organizations she was active in. She was working with Jews. And um, in the 1930s, um, when she was working with Justine Polier, who became one of her close friends, um, she said to Justine, um, when I need help, 
about a social problem, the Jews are the always, always the first to come forward to offer to help. And uh, she came to, to admire them and to depend on them uh, as, as colleagues. You know, at the same time that, as I said, that she hadn't completely shed these ideas about Jews. And she, she, you know, she advocated spreading Jews out <laughs> more, more thinly among the you know, professions they were dominant in, spread them out in the country. That, I mean, she saw that as a way of reducing anti-Semitism, but it was, you know, it's also a kind of, you know, we'd see it today as a kind of form of anti-Semitism. Or quotas, right? <laughs> so, anyway. I think that um, what you just suggested, that people look at her actions, is very important. Rather than these few anecdotes that get repeated over and over again about her youthful anti Semitism. Because in 1921, for example, Rose Schneiderman, who was the founder of the Women's Trade Union League, came here for dinner and became a friend of Eleanor and Franklin right. and educated them about the labor movement. And you can have that kind of interaction with people like Rose Schneiderman and Eleanor Morgenthau mm. and continue to have a profound sense of anti-Semitism, it seems to me. And the other thing that I'd like you to comment on is her friendship with Lillian Wald who brought yeah. her a great deal of information about what was going on with the Jews in the 1930s in mm. Germany, which she then pervaded in her column, My mm. Day. So could you talk a bit more about that? I'm not sure what you're, are you, are you asking about the fact that, that Eleanor Roosevelt did not speak out in My Day against no, what was going on? No, she did. What? And she got her information from Lillian Wald who yeah. had good contacts in Germany. So could you talk a bit ab more about that? Yeah. Um, yeah, El Elder Roosevelt knew in a very personal way what was going on in Germany from, from Lillian Wall, from Alice Hamilton, from James uh, McDonald, who was, um, James McDonald uh, was head of the Foreign Policy Association and had, uh, close contacts in, in Germany and the German government. And he went there um, in 1933, just after Hitler came to power, um, and actually spoke with Hitler about, about the persecution of the Jews, which was already beginning. And, um, and Hitler told him, you know, we're, we're gonna show the world how to solve the Jewish problem, you know, essentially. And he came back and um, asked to see Eleanor Roosevelt, who they were, they were friends, and she immediately invited him to the White House and made sure that he not only reported to her, but spent a couple hours with, with FDR. And, uh, and then, um, there were several more meetings uh, that she arranged with FDR as McDonald became the um, High Commissioner for Refugees coming out of Germany, which was established by the League of Nations. And so he was trying to handle the refugees who were coming out, and, and coming into France, for example. He got so frustrated with it, I mean, he, he found that he couldn't solve it. It was a political issue and not one that someone in his position could solve. And, um, but he came back and reported about his work and the difficulties of it to Eleanor and to Franklin. So, so they knew what Hitler was about from very early on. You know. um, neither Eleanor nor Franklin or, or the Roosevelt administration spoke publicly, you know, critically of the persecution of the Jews in Germany. And that's been, you know, that was puzzling. Um, but it, Richard Brightman, who wrote a book called FDR and the Jews, has written another book recently called The Berlin Mission. And it's about our consul to Berlin, 
during the 30s. He was actually a consular from 1929 to 1939. And uh, he, he worked at, um, Clarence Pickett knew him because the, the, the Quakers had, um, were in Germany trying to help get immigrants out. And um, Geist was very sympathetic to Jewish immigrants and was trying to get them out. And Geist reported back to the State Department. He said, don't publicly criticize Germany. If you do that, they may break diplomatic relations. And if they break diplomatic relations, we won't have any consulates in Germany, and I won't be able to do my work anymore. You know, I won't be able to get anybody out. Um, so that, uh, I didn't know that, you know, before uh, Breitman wrote that book, I, I didn't know about that aspect of it, but it, it helps explain um, why, um, why the Roosevelt administration did not condemn what was going on, and why Eleanor Roosevelt didn't, didn't do, do that either. So, um, other questions? Oh, sorry. Who is next? <laughs> but I must say, you said no historian has dealt with this. Um, and I, I must disagree. Mm -hmm. I didn't deal with Israel enough, but I did deal with this at great length. Uh -huh. And there are many, many people in Germany, women writers and activists, who are very close to Eleanor Roosevelt, mm -hmm. and in France, and in Britain. Mm -hmm. And so there's this whole underground movement, like Breyer, and who, whose book has just been reprinted, Visa for Avalon, and everybody should reread Breyer's Visa for Avalon. Nobody listened. She was warning everybody from 1932 on. Mm -hmm. And these are people, Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, there's just endless numbers of contacts. Uh -huh. And the decision not to speak out was political. Um, you know, FDR didn't want to lose the election. And we now know how many fascists there are in mm -hmm. this country and the reality of anti-Semitism. And so what makes the quietude so disgusting is the reality of how much support the Nazis really had here. And I just think um, other people have dealt with this in very vigorous ways. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yep. Hi, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, as a Jewish American, the turning away of the St. Louis ship by the US government was really heartbreaking to see. Um, w did Eleanor Roosevelt have a stance on the St. Louis ship, and why do you think it was turned away? Well, sh she did. I don't think I don't think Blanche found any anything about Eleanor Roosevelt and the St. Louis, and I didn't either. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt was involved in another ship called the Kwanzaa, uh, which um, which was in a similar. It was a much smaller group of people. Uh, it's not as well known, but that ship. Uh, did land in um, I can't remember was it Baltimore um, and um, Norfolk Norfolk oh you want to say something about it yeah hi um, so I'm from Newport News Virginia and um, my so there was a ship called the Kwanzaa that came over a year after the St. Louis. And, um, and there were 83, 80, a, 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 over 80 refugees were on this ship. And they were denied entry in New York. They were denied entry in Mexico. And then they were going to refuel in my hometown port, which is in Hampton Roads, Virginia. I, I grew up in Newport News, and this was in Norfolk. And lawyers held the ship at port. It was some family members of mine who held the ship at port. Eleanor Roosevelt did put, she did um, communicate with, yes, yeah, she did want them to come in as her guest. She communicated with um, um, Breckenridge Long at the time. 
and said that we should let them in. And she was also communicating with her husband, right, Blanche? Yes. Blan <laughs> Blanche was in my film, so she was the expert on this topic, if you want to But wanted also the one that, well, I mean, she, you know, she was appalled when the SS St. Louis was sent back. And it was like, who was it? Earl Miller was stationed somewhere. He said, do you know that ship is out there and they're turning it around? And it's not clear what happened, that she couldn't stop it. But when the SS, she said, this will be the last time. And then the SS Kwanzaa. Mm -hmm. And then Breckenridge Wong goes crazy after, after that. And he says to FDR, who's in charge here? Me or your wife? <laughs> and, um, and so FDR says, you. And gives, yeah. And this is interesting. The way, the proof of this was in Breckenridge Long's war diaries. So if anybody wants to look at that, mm -hmm. you can look up his war diaries of, what was it, September, September 1940. And uh, he talks about how frustrated he was with Eleanor. Yeah. yeah. He's very open in his diaries about what he was up to and <laughs> what his attitudes were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hello. Uh, there have been as many as 138 people joining us on Zoom, so hello, Zoomers. Thanks for being with us. Um, a question from one of those virtual attendees, and I think you may have touched on this, but Paula Stern asks, did ER know about the August 1942 warnings of the Nazis' final solution, and did she discuss it, if so, with FDR or with her friend Sumner Wells? She absolutely knew about it, when, yeah, once it became public. Um, and she did not. Um, she she did not speak out um, forcefully about about it. Um, and she initially, for most of the time, took the position of the administration, which was the only way to save the Jews is to win the war, and everything has to go into winning the war. And um, but when. Peter Bergson uh, organized the emergency committee to save the Jews, which had a lot of some support in Congress but, and quite a lot of support th throughout the United States, um, but was not uh, the leading Jewish organizations uh, didn't approve of Peter Bergson's techniques, which were you know to put ads in the full page ads of the paper. Um, criticizing administration for doing nothing. And um, so they put a lot of pressure on, um, on FDR to, to actually do something. What it, what their, their prime demand was to create a rescue agency, a government rescue agency. And Bergson met with Eleanor um, at least twice, maybe three times. And um, as a result of that, um, she did come out and say, finally, I don't know what can be done. I don't know how it can be done. But it is morally imperative that when a, a terrible wrong is being done, uh, we will suffer if we do not act, if we do not do something, make, make a great effort to, to correct it. So um, she, she came to that conclusion. And, and in January of um, 1944, um, Henry Morgenthau had had his, uh, several of his deputies research what the State Department had been doing, how, how they'd been obstructing the admission of refugees and obstructing refugee rescue efforts. Uh, he, he gave a report to FDR about what was going on. Um, and recommended that they create a basically a rescue agency, as Peter Bergson's organization had demanded, and so they did. They created the War Refugee Board. Um, it you know if it had been created earlier, a lot more Jews would have been saved. Um, but it's usually credited with saving two hundred thousand Jews. Um, but it was not well funded. It was um, they had to depend on other other departments to get things done. So it was um, it wasn't as effective as it as it should have been. So 
Here's another uh, from our virtual audience. Robert I asks, did Eleanor Roosevelt ever meet Golda Meir? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was, she was a great admirer and friend of Golda Meir. Golda Meir actually was an, one of the other people who addressed her as Eleanor. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, she became friends with Ben-Gurion, too. She, she was a great admirer of Ben-Gurion. Sarah asks, can you expand a little on her view of Arabs and how she thought Arabs didn't use their land the way they should? And do you think this was a moral and valid point of view? Well, I, I, I think it was, um, it was, it's a difficult one to deal with because I, I understand where she was coming from, but I don't think she, she had appreciation for for other cultures that were so different from what she was familiar with. She didn't know Arabs. You know, she knew Jews well, American Jews, and she had many contacts with them and interactions with them, but she knew very few Arabs, and the ones she knew, she knew fairly superficially. And so she, she, didn't, she didn't know the culture, um, and she was looking, she had this idealistic notion that you know, that Israel would be a model for developing countries. It was a developing country, but it was very different from other developing countries because most of the people were immigrants coming into Palestine and later Israel, um, whereas um, India were, you know, these were not immigrants, Pakistanis were not immigrants who were trying to develop their countries. So, but she thought that, that developing countries could learn a lot from Israel and that if the Arabs would just make peace with Israel, uh, that Israel would aid them, would help, you know, had technical expertise, that had experience that would help the, the Arab countries develop. Um, and she knew that the Israeli leaders were, wanted to do that. I mean, you know, there, there, was, there was a potential for exchange for the Arab countries had natural resources like oil that would have been helpful to Israel's development and Israel had had this expertise which would have been helpful to the Arab countries so you know she was she was an optimist and an idealist and she 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 had a wonderful vision of what might might be possible if there was peace between them but um, it was you know it was naive so Thank you. Um, not sure that that was naive. That's actually coming to fruition now in the Abraham Accords, one of the main drivers for the UAE in entering and being the first to enter into the Abraham Accords was to do a deal with Israel right. and have the um, transfer of technology in agriculture right. because they were becoming very food insecure. Yeah. Uh, so as a result, which was exacerbated by the pandemic, yeah. and the very first minister that flew to Israel after the Accords mm -hmm. was the Minister of Agriculture. How do you grow things in right. the desert? Show us how to do that, and we'll do it better than you do, mm -hmm. and they are doing that now. But I had a question about, was Eleanor aware of Susua in the Dominican Republic when the ship of Jews was turned away from the United States, and they went to Dominican Republic, and they were allowed in ironically, by the dictator, who was himself a tremendous racist. Um, but it happened that the Jews on that ship happened to be white. And so he let them into Dominican Republic through a city called Susua. And mm -hmm. they did live there and eventually migrate to the rest of South America, where they could get visas to travel, to go further into the Americas. Was she aware of that? Did she help them in any way? Um, it was I don't, a small I don't know. group do of you, people. Do you know anything about that, Blanche? I don't know. Yeah. Oh. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, Dominican Republic was the one country that was willing to take Jewish immigrants. They, they were willing to take uh, um, during the 1930s. But That's right. Um, in, into Susua. Yeah. But mostly because they were white. It, it was yeah, a he wanted, act, he wanted but it to, uh, he was white. He wanted to population. lighten the the skin right. color of his people. That's yeah. Exactly right. Yeah, it was not for the best of motives. 